Welcome to Behind the Bastards, where we talk about atrocities. Talking about sad things. Ah, what an incredible introduction. Sophie, I need to get one of those. Can we can we put no. one on order? Yeah, we're putting you one really on order. Should. You really gonna... should. I, you know, they're they're not that expensive and no. uh, they make uh, the sad stuff hurt less. Yeah, I think I should get one of those and that's how I should just read every episode. I could just sing all of these stories. Yeah, yeah. it's like you could it's you can learn and uh also you can cope at the same time, which yeah. is Nice. That, to you can both. lope. Yeah. Don't we all want to lope? <laughs> Sophie's Sophie's eyes and her 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 words say no, but my desire to have one of those things says yes. No. <laughs> your face is saying no, but your mouth is also saying no. Both are saying no. All right. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, what an exciting episode we have for today. A lot of uh, fun yeah, drama. No, There's no. going to be a car chase. Uh, Matt's going to finish his taxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get, you get back to those taxes, and I'll start talking about Joey Mangs again. Yeah, because, but you oh, know, I'm going to, I'm once again, I did this is the first episode. I'm doing this the last episode. I'm opening with a plug, motherfuckers. Oh, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug out. Uh, the, uh, this is the thing. I uh, mostly talk about The Wire and uh, or, you know, TV shows in general. I We did. Uh, it's Pot Yourself a Gun is the name of the podcast. Pot Yourself a Gun. Give us five stars in review and um, uh, listen to us talk about uh, The Wire. We just finished season two, which was on the docks. And, uh, you know, that was uh, a, a definitely a polarizing season. But uh, oh, that was my I favorite season. One. Yeah, I think. uh it's important. It 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 shows a lot of uh, the under under discussed side of how the the drug trade works. Exactly, um, and it yeah. also you know it uh, talks about Polish people and you know how many of them history's it takes. greatest monsters. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad we're talking about this, right? You know, mm -hmm. the, it talks about how many of them it takes to screw in a light bulb. Yeah. Ooh, a lot, uh, a lot. Yeah, a shocking number. A shocking number. And, and on the next speaking episode of, of Behind the Bastards, <laughs> the Polish people. Wow, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> that is especially inappropriate, given that we are talking about Auschwitz. Yes, um, yes. But that you, there, the people who want to cancel you for that are going to have to get in line between behind all the other things. I mean, seriously, at this point, <laughs> yeah. I've the Jar Jar, Jar, Jar sound bites alone. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, how rude. Very rude. <laughs> I understand why you wouldn't be busting, but you know mm -hmm. what? Still, Misa Bustin. Misa Bustin. So, thank you, thank Don't you for that that gentle landing back into Mangala territory. <sighs> so, Joseph Mangala, mm. um, he gets portrayed a lot in kind of popular media. You know, if you watch stuff like The Boys from Brazil and or, or whatever, he's like this Nazi mad scientist. He's obsessed with creating, you know, new Aryan people or hit clones of Hitler. All right. this kind of like like Marvel ass shit. Right. It's um, a Dr. Wolfenstein type guy. Yeah. You know? and, and that's very much how Mengele, almost immediately after the war, how Mengele gets contextualized up until David Marwell's book, Unmasking the Angel of Death. And, and Marwell points out Mengele, what he's doing, like his research is, is not him just being a crazy asshole or him wanting to hurt people. He's not doing anything for out of pure maliciousness. Um, what he's doing is carrying out experiments for on behalf of other scientists who are h more highly regarded than him in order to like pursue ends that they could not pursue without the sheer quantity of bio bodies that Auschwitz provided them with. Right. Um, he was planning to use the research that he did at the camp as the basis for his uh, habit Facilitation Schrift, which is the German word for a postdoctoral thesis, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of if you want to be a professional academic, and that was his dream to be a respected scientist, that's a thing you have to do first. Um, he is not the only scientist at a death camp who is in this, who is a doctor at a death camp who's in this boat of like, I've got my MD, I want to be an academic scientist when the war ends, so I'm going to do research here and I'm going to help people who are more respected than I am do research here so that I can grease palms and, and get my way into basically they're all like g gunning for fucking getting 
uh, the equivalent of a uh, tenure, you know, like right. that's, that's the kind of thing he's looking for here. And yeah. he's hoping that like, if I help people out here, you know, um, I'm just trying to get job stability guys. Come on. It's th- that a, is it's what he's doing. It's very, very competitive. So yeah. if I have to do a little bit of murder, mm-hmm. a little bit of torture, it's part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you can't you can't even get into a postgraduate program here without both a sixteen hundred on your SATs and two years at a death camp. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. very important. You mm-hmm. have to get very very high on your death camp SATs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, you can't. Hey, don't blame me for having the grind set mindset. <laughs> and <Most> it's <laughs> specifically the meat grinder set minder set. <laughs> It's actually more fucked up than that because one of Mengele's colleagues at Auschwitz, Dr. Hans Delmott, um, is also working on getting doing his postdoctoral thesis, but no. he's not doing it on his own. He he saves a Jewish inmate physician who he enslaves and makes him help him with his dissertation. <laughs> like that, that, that's literally what these guys are doing is they're enslaving better doctors so that they can get help getting their fucking dissertations. Insane. In, just yeah. completely insane. See, it's makes like, you not as worried about chat GPT cheating on a, uh, on right. tests, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's not even that bad compared See, to this. this is- this is why fucking, you know, people are like, oh, but it's positive stereotypes. Well, sometimes those can be used against you. All yeah, right. Yeah. I know a lot of bad Jewish doctors. OK, so fucking don't enslave the good ones, please. Yeah, don't enslave. Well, yeah. So like his fellow Nazi doctors, Joseph deliberately cultivated a stable of gifted slave doctors, men and women to help him carry out research and prepare human body parts for transfer to institutions in Germany, like the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Before the war, Twin studies had been hard to carry out, but during Mengele's time at Auschwitz, more than 750,000 people passed through its doors, which is a lot of twins, alongside people with all manner of disabilities he wanted samples from. At one point, he came across a hunchback and his son who had a club foot. Mengele was immediately fascinated by both men, and he sent them off to Dr. Miklos, whose office was the dissecting room by the number one crematorium. Here's Miklos. Father and son, their faces wan from their miserable years in the Liesmannstraat ghetto, were filled with forebodings. They looked at me questioningly. I took them across the courtyard, which at this hour of the day was filled with sunlight. On our way to the dissecting room, I reassured them with a few well-chosen words. Luckily, there were no corpses on the dissecting table. It would have indeed been a horrible sight for them to come upon. To spare them, I decided not to conduct the examination in the austere dissecting room, which reeked with the odor of formaldehyde, but in the pleasant, well-lighted study hall. From our conversation, I learned that the father had been a respected citizen of Litzmannstad, a wholesaler in cloth. During the years of peace between the wars, he had often taken his son with him on his business trips to Vienna to have him examined and treated by the most famous specialists. I first examined the father in detail, omitting nothing. The deviation of his spinal column was the result of retarded rickets. In spite of a most thorough examination, I discovered no symptom of any other illness. I tried to console him by telling him that he would probably be sent to a work camp. But he was not. Uh, both father and son are shot on Mengele's orders, and Miklos is forced to uh, autopsy them while they are still warm. Um, after that, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it gets bleaker. Late in the afternoon. Does it? Ha- yeah, I'm it good. does. It does. It does get worse. Uh, that's uh, It gets a lot worse. Late in the afternoon, having already sent at least 10,000 men to their death, Dr. Mangala arrived. He listened attentively to my report concerning both the in vivo and post-mortem observations made on the two victims. These bodies must not be cremated, he said. They must be prepared and their skeletons sent to the Anthropological Museum in Berlin. What systems do you know for the preparation of skeletons? And there are a couple of ways to prepare a skeleton when uh, a living thing dies. The ultimate solution Miklos picked was basically to boil the dead bodies until the meat could be removed. He had to sit and wait by the casks bubbling over a fire while they cooked. At one point, a group of Polish prisoners found them and starving mistook them for stew. Um, oh, and they had bro. to be stopped. Yeah, I mean, it's like bro. it's it's like it's nightmarish. It's it's ghastly. Bro. Uh, Come on. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you like I, I i feel like it's not enough to say he had people killed and sent their body parts to universities like i don't think that gets at 
if you want the story of Joseph Mengele, it's important to have the texture of like, this is what's being done. Like, Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't mean, know how no, else you to need tell to the know story. This stuff, but yeah, uh, again, no, it's it's a fucking nightmare. Doing my taxes. Doing yeah, do it. <laughs> right getting, getting getting those uh, getting those deductions in. What is filing some finding some ten ninety five search? <laughs> yeah. Um. Now there was some actual scientific research done at Auschwitz and done under Mengele. Uh, the best example of this would be a study into a rare illness called Noma. Uh, David Marwell recounts in a chilling passage how he first became aware of this research. In the mid 1980s, he was going through a historical collection in a German town called Bad Erlson when he came across a form signed by Dr. Mengele requesting that histological sections be made from a medical specimen sent to the SS laboratory on June 29th, 1944. The specimen was almost certainly prepared by our friend Miklos. Quote, it indicated that the specimen being sent to the laboratory was the head of a 12-year-old boy. At the time, I was unaware of any conceivable reason why such a specimen would be of interest to Joseph Mengele, and this document only reinforced my notion of him as a wildly sadistic, grotesque monster. But Marwell dug into precisely why the sample had been made. Now, it did not challenge the opinion that Mengele is a monster, but it did make it clear that there was nothing wild or sadistic about why he was doing this. Noma is a rare disease. It's been with us for thousands of years and is sometimes called the grazer. In fact, Noma is derived from the Greek word nemo, which means to graze or devour. When human beings are forced to live in close quarters with poor sanitation and little nutrition, they get these ulcers in their mouth, and left untreated, these ulcers grow and will eventually devour the cheek and lip and basically the entire head. Mm -hmm. These necrotic lesions expose bone and teeth and are fatal. One Czech inmate doctor later testified, whole chunks of flesh would come off the affected areas. The lower jaw was also affected. I never saw such severe cases of gangrene of the cheek. Um... And these are the samples, these are the heads, the heads of people with this disease are what Mengele is preserving and sending off to uh, educational institutions in the Reich. Mengele was excited by the outbreak of Noma because it provided him with an opportunity to send his colleagues samples of this extremely rare disease. That's that's where the sadistic part comes in, the part where he is excited about the outbreak. Yeah, uh, that's that's like, and I mean, it, it gets, it's so fucked up, like, so he he does they do attempt to treat this and they do he assigns a prominent pediatrician who had been arrested by the Nazis to like manage the research of how to treat this and this guy named Epstein this doctor he and Mengele experiment with a number of treatments for Noma from medications to diets um, some of what Mengele did is basically like. He's alleged to have taken fluid from the ulcers of Noma sufferers and injected it into healthy inmates to try to study how it spreads, which is a a horrible, horrible crime. But he is you can see he's he's not like doing this for no reason. He's doing this because he's trying to get a dissertation. Basically, he wants to right. like it's not it's not um. It's not like random madness, you know, right, that's, right, right, that's right, driving right. this. Um, yeah, he, he's not actually doing what I think, uh, like you've been saying, like the popular culture yeah. would have you believe that it is just a guy who's just like, what if I, you know, fucking make an no. eight armed person? Yeah. Um, just to make something horrible and grotesque, just to prove my evil. And in, in this case, it's just like, what if a sociopath also was into experiments? Yeah. And w- what if, and the thing. Thing, like the important thing is that like p- the reason he's excited is partly because he knows that other doctors are interested in this. And so right. he's able to provide them with things that they need that will improve their opinion of him and his standing in the medical establishment. Yeah. So, so part of why he's excited is he says more opportunities for fucking yeah, career advancement. Yeah. He's a career he's, guy, right? Oh yeah. God. Oh, this would be great for my LinkedIn page. Eat a dick. <laughs> yeah. Um, now Epstein is a competent physician and because he has more test subjects than anyone who has studied Noma before, have ever had he succeed he succeeds in creating a pretty groundbreaking treatment for noma um which is like good it's good to solve you know a disease to find sure. a way to treat it um but i would hesitate that people like credit this as a medical advancement due to death camp experiments because right. as marwell notes it must be kept in mind that the disease was a product of the camp itself simple right. measures of sanitation and a modest standard of nutrition were all that would have been necessary to prevent an outbreak epstein might have solved the riddle of the treatment but no child he cured of this disease survived the camp 
Yeah. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's yeah solving a, a problem with an outbreak that you fucking created. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's bombing the village to save it kind of logic. Right. Now, this begs the question, though, what kind of twin research did Mengele get up to at Auschwitz and what was its actual purpose? Uh, Gerald Posner, who wrote one of the earlier biographies of Mengele, like most people, imagines his purpose as some nefarious ploy to try and create new Aryans by finding ways to recreate the conditions which cause people to have twins. Right. And this is this is like the standard line on Mengele for decades is that like, well, he was doing all this twin research because he was trying to find ways to like help Aryans have more twins, right? Right, right. And a big reason why this spreads is because of Dr. Miklos. Um, he's probably the first person to suggest this, and he suggests this because he works directly for Mengele on twins who had been murdered at Auschwitz. But Mengele did not treat Miklos like an academic equal. He's not like walking him through why he's doing all of this stuff. And so Miklos's belief is understandable, but it doesn't reflect the most likely explanation for these experiments. Marwell points out that if that had been the purpose of Mengele's research, he would have been studying the parents of twins, right? Because yeah. that's at least as important. If what you're trying to do is make there be more twins. Yeah. What he was actually doing with all these twin studies is providing his mentor, Von Verschuer, with a steady supply of twins he could run tests on to check all sorts of heredity theories, right? He is getting letters from different doctors saying, hey, can you conduct this kind of study? Can you conduct this kind of study? And then he's conducting them. He's killing the twins. He's autopsying them. And that's why he's doing it, right? So yeah. it's not, he is not, what's important here is he is not the only person morally culpable in the death of these kids the yeah, other so doctors all asking all of these letters. motherfuckers right yeah exactly um and von Verschuer is like the biggest of them and the fact that he has access to all these kids this kind of what these doctors see as a resource that has never existed before makes Mengele who had previously been a middling to low level figure in German medicine invaluable to the most respected doctors in the country Marwell writes, although twin research was well-funded and promising in its potential to produce meaningful results, its pursuit presented a number of obstacles. It was an extremely involved undertaking, requiring personnel to carry out the various measurements and record-keeping. A supply of appropriate twin pairs had to be identified, located, and induced to participate. The entire process required a huge investment of time and money. In the case of Verschuer's own research at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, it took more than seven months to distribute 1,200 questionnaires to schools in search of twin subjects. That effort produced 1,000 possible twin pairs, but resulted in only 40 who were actually examined. The proposed experiment might be unpleasant, painful, or have side effects. Beyond the disincentives presented by the inconveniences and unknowns of the process, there were also legal hurdles. It was forbidden in Germany, even under the Nazis, to intentionally infect a German citizen with a disease, a prohibition that led many scientists to conduct experiments on themselves. So... <clears throat> In so effect, they're really cutting through the red tape. Is what exactly, they exactly. And they're doing it because Mengele, he's like a dealer. He's like a twin dealer to doctors in the Reich. Like, oh, you got some twin studies you need done. Like Joey Mengs, he's got your back. You know, maybe help him with his dissertation when he gets out of Auschwitz. Yeah. I know a guy. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of a piece of shit, but <laughs> he's got yeah. the twins you need. So people would send him requests. He would do the studies. He'd kill the twins. Then he'd have Miklos, you know, take off parts of their bodies or whatever. And they would be mailed to different institutes marked urgent war materials. Now, this was that's not like this seems like it's probably just like, oh, it's a convenient way for them to get priority in the packages. But for soldier scientists like Mengele, this is part of the war effort. This is the war right. effort. This is right? the whole war for him. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a race war. This is why, and it, this is how the broader German Nazi establishment sees it, which is why in the last days of the war, when they are getting their asses handed to them, they're diverting crucial military resources to inter ensuring the camps can continue to operate because that's a front of the battle for them. Um, Insane. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> fucking Nazis, man. Yeah. Um, uh, once again, on record, mm -hmm. anti-Nazi. Anti-Nazi. Good. Fair. So back at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, von Verschuer planned to create a department of embryology and a vast collection of human samples and embryos, including fetuses and stillborn infants removed at the camp and sent to his institute. 
Now, God, I do not want to go that. Like, that's got to be the creepiest fucking institute. Oh, it, of all yeah. Time. I mean, the building is still in use, right? Uh, they don't <laughs> call it that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Did they get rid of their jar room? Probably. <laughs> yeah. That. I mean, not as quickly as you'd expect. Really? Um, God. <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the body parts that are taken out are in use up until like the eighties, nineties. I mean, there was a story in two thousand fourteen on what used because it's like a college campus um and what used to be the kaiser wilhelm institute right outside they find like a, a bunch of people's bones and like they don't know who's like the government got rid of those very quickly was yeah. like yeah we, we don't need to be looking into why these bones are here whose bones they are let's <laughs> oh, let's yeah, get those bones just yeah. pop up it's a th- oh, dinosaurs. yeah man. yeah <laughs> those are dinosaur bones let's move on <laughs> speaking of moving on you know what really helps me move on uh, what what makes you move on? Is it uh, products and services? It is products and services. Products and services that had no role in, say, Auschwitz, which None. in addition to being a death camp, was not also a manufacturing facility for modern day corporations like the IG Farben Company, who now makes your aspirin. Oh, yeah. They didn't use slave workers who were worked to death, ensuring their future profits, which they were allowed to roll into the business after the Holocaust and the end of the Reich. That didn't happen. That would be fucked up. You wouldn't let that happen. No, these are good products and services. Yeah. I'm never going to take aspirin again. Mm hmm. That's right, baby. Never. Advil. (laughs) <laughs> oh shit. I Advil. We we're talking about the Bayer Company. Mm-hmm. Bleep this out. Oh, we were. Yeah, Bayer. Yeah. Oh, it is Bayer. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I'm t- looking up who makes Advil. Who makes Advil? Look it up. Because I think we could get a pretty good pretty good uh 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 pretty good ad out of this. You know, Advil we were not involved in the Holocaust. Advil, uh, we were not involved in the Holocaust. Yeah, no, it's clear. Boots UK. I think we're good. Yeah. We had nothing to do with it. Take some pills. Your headache will go I thought away. Advil was Pfizer. No, it looks like it was invented at least by some British company. But it's, but it's manufactured by Pfizer, is it not? Sure, but they didn't kill any people. They didn't. They, they're not responsible also for hundreds of thousands of deaths, Sophie. That doesn't All seem Pfizer right. All did was make boner pills, and now my dick is hard. <laughs> Robert Evans, a big pharma apologist. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, weird, weird take from you, sir. Mm-hmm. We're back and we're talking about all the different big pharma companies that and how do they're not good. have. And how yeah, Robert that loves them. They're his I'm favorite. A huge fan. Love them. Big, big pharma, pharma bro. Like Martin Absolutely. Shkreli. That's right. So <clears throat> the best known story about Mengele at Auschwitz is probably. Taxes. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> um, is is the the one that like the idea that he supposedly sewed two inmates together to try yeah, and create a Siamese twin. Yeah, that's the one I've heard. This twin. is like the, the, the Siamese yeah. twin myth. Yeah, thing. yeah, that is a frequent myth. There's also allegations he tried to quote make boys into girls and girls into boys through cross transfusions, mm-hmm. uh, and that he connected the urinary tract of a seven-year-old girl to her own colon. And if you hear these stories, like, that's all mad, crazy doctor shit. Right. Um, obviously, because the Nazis destroyed a lot of records and Joseph himself is not a reliable source on his activities, we will never know exactly what he did. But David, David Marwell points out that a lot of these stories are either false or exaggerations of reality or kind of misattributions of real crimes to Mengele. Mm. Um, and this gets us into a really complicated piece of Holocaust history, which is the Mengele effect. In the aftermath of World War II, spoilers, Mengele escapes, right? He gets away in large part because he doesn't get that tattoo on his arm that all the SS guys get. So when he's being, after he gets, you know, the unit he's with gets captured because he embeds with a Wehrmacht unit. When the Americans are processing them, they don't immediately see, oh, this is a fucking SS guy. Let's put him in, you know, make sure he's not one of the ones that we're looking for. So he does get away. But 
By that point, Auschwitz had already kind of written itself into the heart and soul of the human race, and the first inmates to be interviewed talked about the doctors who had so often been the architect of their misery. Some of the people who survived in best health and thus were in the best position to talk were Mengele's patients, because his patients, the twins and stuff that he works with, he took really good care of a lot of the time. They would enjoy good food and better accommodations until they were killed, right? And he's not doing that out of the goodness of his heart. It's because he wants... The test subjects that can withstand the testing that he was going to do. Mm -hmm. But because of this, some of the people who he hadn't got to when he flees Auschwitz are some of the first people who were able to talk. And just in general, Mengele's name spreads very quickly as one of the architects of this nightmare that is Auschwitz. And a curious thing occurs after that, which is that more and more Auschwitz inmates over the years record Mengele experiences than could possibly have known or seen him. Part of how Mm -hmm. we know that these are not accurate recollections is that he's often described as tall, blonde, and well-built. Mengele was five foot eight and dark haired. Um, historian Zdenek Zovka claims that almost all inmates at Auschwitz would later claim to have been selected personally by Mengele when they arrived at the camp, which can't have been possible. We simply know that many other doctors were doing that job. Mm. Herman Langbein was an Auschwitz survivor and author of the seminal book People in Auschwitz. He noted that many former inmates not only insisted they'd had direct contact with Mengele, but, and this is really strange, they tended to remember him as being hot. Um, and I'm huh. like trying not to joke about this, but I am going to read you a quote from this guy's book. It's very strange. Some well-known SS men have been positively idealized after the fact. Thus, Fania Fenelon has called Mengele a handsome Siegfried, and Therese Chesang writes, Mengele is immaculate in his belted uniform, tall, with shiny black boots that bespeak cleanliness, prosperity, and human dignity. He does not move a muscle. He is insensitive. Elie Wiesel mentions that Mengele's characteristic attributes as white gloves, a monocle, and the rest. Jiri Steiner, a twin used by Mengele in his series of experiments, speaks of his and angelic smile, and Siegfried Vanderberg believes in a, that in a film, Mengele should be portrayed by no less than the famous lady killer, Ramon Navarro. Carl Laszlo describes Mengele as a strikingly handsome man who had a fascinating, spellbinding effect even on female prisoners, and continues, Mengele came with a motionless face, and his beautiful, regular, cold features that seemed to be carved out of stone appeared to be the mark of death itself. In his shiny boots, he walked rhythmically on the camp road. I saw Mengele almost every day in the office of the SS infirmary where he was doing routine bureaucratic work, and he struck me as neither particularly attractive nor elegant. I never saw him wear a monocle. Now, Langbein, obviously, these guys are all at Auschwitz. Elie Wiesel is one of the most famous Holocaust survivors there is. Right. You know, he writes fucking night. They're not like... It, it like the, 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 again, there's no I'm not putting any shade on these people for the fact that their memories of this are kind of fucked up. Yeah. And La- Langbein coins the term the Mengele effect to describe what he calls a form of memory displacement where real memories of trauma are mutated sometimes into different acts of terror and generally credited not to whichever Nazi had committed them, but put to the man who became the most famous symbol of Nazi evil at Auschwitz, Joseph Mengele. Langbein makes one of the most important observations in Holocaust studies, um, one that inspired this series when he writes, quote, those who kept the machinery of murder going in Auschwitz were not devils. They were humans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, there, there is also part of me that's just like, yeah, you know, this is just sounds like years and years of conditioning of right. my dad being like, marry a doctor mm-hmm. and this uh, eventually you start looking at anyone as a doctor is hot so mm-hmm. that's that's <laughs> yeah. probably what happened it's just like <laughs> y- he's a doctor you say i mean i'm telling you <laughs> this is a, it's something it's a it's a very jewish trait we all mm-hmm. want to marry a doctor so we see a doctor it doesn't matter if it's uh, oz or mangala i guess <laughs> yeah. Both um, equally bad, boy, by the way. Boy, howdy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so David Marwell they elaborates did both on get episodes on this podcast. They, they, did, they did. They did. They did. They did. Both bastards. Mm-hmm. You can't talk that, about that one is, without that is the true. other. That is true. <laughs> 
So David Marwell elaborates on this kind of peculiar aspect of, of Auschwitz further. The notion of Mengele as unhinged, driven by demons and indulging grotesque and sadistic impulses, should be replaced by something perhaps even more unsettling. Mengele was, in fact, in the scientific vanguard, enjoying the confidence and mentorship of the leaders in his field. And... Uh, yeah, that's um, that's kind of the most unsettling thing, or at least one of them about this, is that experimentation is the norm at Auschwitz. Uh, yeah. And Mengele joined many of his colleagues in utilizing patients as experimental resources. They were able to justify this to themselves, not by saying, you know, fuck these people, they all have it coming. Most of them did not talk about it that way. And most of them were capable of being perfectly, like, polite and even to some degree sensitive to the patients or to the inmates that they worked with on a daily basis guys right, like but they had this ideology based on like well this is gr- for the greater scientific good of exactly. our particular exactly. race and they all they found also uh, aside from that they found other ways a lot of ways they would justify it as like that well these people are sick they're all going to die anyway we might as well learn something from them you know yeah. the government's <laughs> decided they're going to kill all these people so what can i do i can't do anything but maybe yeah. i can help a few people here and there you know yeah um this is, this and isn't it probably the most sickening part of it is the people yeah. going like you know, these people are all going to die anyway. And it's like, not if you don't let it happen. <laughs> you don't have to do this. You're part of the machine. <laughs> yeah. God damn. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they, they don't, they, they don't seem to take that into account. So we have some idea of how Joseph rationalized his own behavior because half a lifetime later, when he's on the run, he spends two weeks with his estranged son, Rolf. And this is when he's an old man. He's kind of near death. And Rolf is Rolf is an interesting character. He He's part of how Posner's biography gets written because he brings Posner after his dad dies. His dad's Mengele writes a memoir that's like he writes it like a fiction novel where he gives himself a fake name and like kind of fictional writes a basically this is the fictional story Moses of a doctor Jangela. at Auschwitz. He does um, a he does an if I did it. Like he does he does an OJ with his fucking memoirs. Um but Rolf, you know, Mengele's family supports him for his the entire rest of his life. They're like, because they're rich. They're uh, still to this day. There's the Mengele company is successful. They're sending him money. They help him stay on the run. And Rolf kind of grows up. He only meets Mengele once when he's a child. Um, and he's being he's told that Joseph is not his dad, but his uncle, who's like on the run because the allies are unfairly prosecuting him. But as he grows yeah, up, he, they, he, they exchange letters when he becomes an adult. And, and Rolf, uh, number one, winds up being left wing, which like his family is deeply conservative. They're fucking Nazis. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so eventually like, <laughs> he has, he, he's he's very he's very conflicted. He comes to accept. He is, the, the, number one, there's less information available, you know, at this period of time. Mm-hmm. Like, the internet's not a thing. But he comes to accept, maybe I don't know exactly what my dad did. Maybe the Allied stories aren't exactly accurate. But my dad did fucked up shit at Auschwitz, and it's indefensible, right? He comes yeah. to that conclusion, which, fair enough, good for you, Rolf. Um, and so he he travels to meet his dad in Brazil, near kind of the end of his father's life, for a two-week period. Um, and Rolf, you know, again, had educated himself a little on the Holocaust and, and Posner talks to him for his book. And here's what he says about this meeting where he talks to his dad about what his dad did at Auschwitz. I proposed that, and this is Ralph, Rolf talking. I proposed that whatever he or anyone else did or did not do in Auschwitz, I deeply detested it since I regard Auschwitz as one of the most horrible examples of inhumanity and brutality. He said, I did not understand. He went there, had to do his duty to carry out orders. He said that everybody had to do so in order to survive the basic instinct of self-preservation. He said he wasn't able to think about it. From his point of view, he was not personally responsible for the incidents at the camp. He said he didn't invent Auschwitz. It already existed. He said that he wanted to help people in the camp, but there had been a limit to what he could do. As far as selections were concerned, he said, the situation was analogous to a field hospital during a time of war. If 10 wounded soldiers are brought into the hospital in critical condition, the doctor must make almost instantaneous decisions about whom to operate on first. By choosing one, then necessarily another must die. My father asked me, when people arrived at the railhead, what was I supposed 
supposed to do. People were arriving infected with disease, half dead. He said it was beyond anyone's imagination to describe the circumstances there. His job had been to classify only those able to work and those unable to work. He said he tried to grade as many people as able to work as possible. What my father was trying to do was persuade me that in this manner, he had saved thousands of people from certain death. <laughs> he said, what, is, uh, what, uh, what am I, one man supposed to do when given so many twins to kill? <laughs> You saying in my position, you you wouldn't do the same thing. You wouldn't okay. kill all those twins, those beautiful twins waiting to die. <laughs> but I have to learn about them. What would you learn? I don't know, but someone will figure out something I learned. God, yeah. what, we like figured just... out how to cure a disease that we caused them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fucking a. And he's just uh, like, listen. I was just like any regular mm, doctor mm, who mm. has a bunch of slave doctors working for them to do yeah, experiments yeah, on twins yeah. to die. We've all all been there. We've all been there. <laughs> Ask anyone who's been to medical school whether or not they would have done the same thing. <laughs> I think you'll find. Yeah. I'm normal. Uh. I'm going to continue Rolf's quote. He said that he did not order and was not responsible for gassings, and he said that twins in the camp owed their lives to him. He said that he personally had never harmed anyone in his life. Yeah, I had a slave do that. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez, guys. Or was that SS man who was drinking himself to death? Yes. He was the one who shot all those SS people. SS or slaves. Yeah. I, on the other hand, was sober the whole time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's good, right? <laughs> You know what is good, though? What? What could possibly be good? Services. You know, both of those things. Yeah, those are good. Those are good. Ah, we're back. So we know that Mengele's claims that he didn't directly harm anyone are an obscenity uh, and and, and not just bullshit. Yeah, Uh, it would be laughable if I wasn't crying already. Yeah. The crimes that we have already covered that Joseph committed personally are enough to make him one of the worst bastards that has ever been on this show. Mm-hmm. And we are we have just kind of scraped the surface of the shit that this guy got up to. And while it is possible some of these are examples of the Mengele effect, all of them were present on the indictment that he received from a West German court. At one point, he said to have taken a newborn child of a Russian woman, grabbed it by the head, and thrown it into a pile of corpses to kill it. At another, he is said to have become so furious when a work gang capo allowed several prisoners selected to die to hide with his men that he shot the capo with his own pistol. At one point, an old man selected to the gas chamber tried to flee to his son, who was in a work group. Mangala bashed his brains open with an iron bar, killing him. At another point, he got angry because a woman gave birth and the selection doctors had failed to warn him she was pregnant. He threw the newborn baby into a stove. He is said to have shot a 16-year-old girl who fled onto the roof out of fear of the gas chamber. Worst of all is the testimony of inmate Anani Silovich Petko, a Russian survivor of Auschwitz. He was there the day a group of 300 children were brought into the camp, having been separated from their parents. They were all under five years old. When Mangala saw the group of children, he complained that it was too hard to gas five-year-old children. So he selected another strategy. Quote, and this is from Petko. After a while, a large group of SS officers arrived on motorcycles, Mengele among them. They drove into the yard and got off their motorcycles. Upon arriving, they circled the flames. It burned horizontally. We watched to see what would follow. After a while, the trucks arrived, dump trucks with children inside. There were ten of these trucks. After they had entered the yard, an officer gave an order, and the trucks backed up to the fire, and they started throwing those children right into the fire, into the pit. The children started to scream. Some of them managed to crawl out of the burning pit. An officer walked around it with sticks and pushed those back in who managed to get out. Hess and Mangalo were present and were giving orders. I'm, I have three pieces of nicotine gum in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <sighs> That's about the worst thing I've ever read. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't m- m- imagine anything worse um, than that. And that's you know Joseph Mengele. Obviously, 
I considered doing a whole episode about how he fled from justice. You know, it is an interesting story. It's interesting to me. All, all of these stories, like the, the the gist of it, basically, is that he spends a couple of years on a farm in Germany, living low. He eventually escapes to South America. He bounces around from like Brazil to Paraguay. There's a period of time where he's able to live under his own name pretty openly, and then uh, the Israelis get Eichmann, and suddenly he has to go deep underground because after Eichmann. And Mengel is like the big prisoner that they haven't caught, you know, mm-hmm. or the big, um, big war criminal that they haven't caught. So he, but he's he's successful and he's able to stay hidden, basically because a lot of Nazis have real solidarity with him. Like it's all old Nazis and just South American dudes who like the Nazis, and they Ugh. they hide him. But he's. It's kind of worth noting all of these sort of fictional depictions of Mangala. There's like all sorts of stories of him as a mad scientist in Latin America trying to remake the master race or whatever. Right. That's not at all his life. He's he's an old man. He spends most of his time where he's working, either selling real estate or working as like a contractor for his family company, selling like farming equipment. <laughs> um he lives off grid for a while with a, a couple of, with a, a family. And like eventually they split up with him because they have a bunch of art. Yeah, but it takes like ten or it takes like a decade or more. Like he's that's not too long. That's people, too long to be with Mangala. That's he, that's never the, mind. But one of the things that's most disturbing though is that like he never does anything terrible while he's on the run that there's any documentation of. Some people will say he was kind of a a dick and as he got older, kind of an unpleasant person. He would send some letters to his son that they weren't emotionally abusive, but they were kind of like, I wish you'd come and visit. You know, I don't approve of, you know, you should get a PA. A big thing, like the biggest thing that he gives his son shit for is that his son became a lawyer but didn't get a PhD in law. And he's like, you should become a doctor. Yeah, follow um, on your father footsteps. You know, the world yeah. needs another Dr. Mengele. <laughs> the point is, though, that he, there's evil is not a thing. Mengele is not just some sort of monster who would have who would have caused horrible harm no matter where he went. Mm-hmm. He was a guy who was willing to use unfathomable evil as a tool for personal advancement and the advancement of what he saw as science. And when that opportunity ended, he was a pretty normal old man. Right. right? And that's I think more frightening. It's way I can, more frightening. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why every time I see like a a Marvel movie, I think it was like, I don't know, it was like fucking Captain America or something, and they like insist on showing the Nazis trying to do like time travel or some something where they're like, this electricity makes Frankensteins. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like you, you know, in making this uh, super villainy, you're actually undercutting what makes it frightening and what yeah. makes it evil because it's... It's, uh, you know, it's, it's the banality of it, you know, yeah. to fucking, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound cliche and whatnot, but it really is the banality yeah. and the bureaucracy and, uh, just kind of the, the, the efficiency models and the flow charts. It's all the fucking office shit that yeah. makes it awful. It's what, you know, it's why I don't, you know, want to work in an office. Yeah, that is, I, uh, that, it's because it's too close to Nazi stuff. Th- yeah, and that is you bring up working in an office. The thing that is most frightening about Joseph Mengele is that every single person listening to this knows somebody with Mengele potential. Yeah, they don't. They're not serial killers. Yep. They're like they are. They are the people who care so much about their own advancement and are able to get themselves so committed to whatever they believe that if they were put in an Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. They would do all the same things. I've worked under so many Mangalas. Yeah, like a hell of a lot of them in the entertainment industry. Yeah, a hell of a lot of the entertainment industry, medical industry, tech when I, you industry, know, tech industry. Yeah. Oh, tons in the tech industry. There's a uh, lot of Mangalas out there. Oops, who all Mangalas. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the new Facebook logo. <laughs> Oops, all Mangalas. Oops, all Mangalas. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, like literally people who are just like, you know, oh, it's too bad that's not, you know, that it's illegal to mm-hmm. do experiments on humans. It's like, wait, is that the only reason you wouldn't do it? Yeah, is that why it's, you get this also when people will talk about like, I mean, the Nazis were fucked up, but people, we did learn a lot from those. No, we didn't. No, we, no, fucking, we fucking didn't. didn't. There was, there, there is one experiment the Nazis carried out on prisoners that taught us anything like really meaningful and it was about like how the body responds to hyperthermia and stuff right. um and like 
a bunch of nonsense, a huge amount of nonsense. Yeah. Uh, like it's, it, it, we will talk a little bit about the other doctors because this is also a podcast about them, but I do want to give, I don't know. It's, it's weird to call this a hopeful story, but I want to talk about how our friend Miklos gets out of Auschwitz and specifically how he saves his family, his oh, wife okay. and his daughter. It's not going to start as a happy story, but it does end as happily as an Auschwitz story can end. Sure. Once when I was dissecting the body of a fairly old man, I discovered some very beautiful gallstones in the bladder. Knowing that Dr. Mengele was an ardent collector of such items, I washed the stones, dried them, and then arranged them in a large-necked flask, stoppered with a glass cork. I stuck a label on the flask, giving the person's name, the kind of stones they were, and their pathological characteristics. During his visit the next day, I gave them to Dr. Mengele. He admired the beautiful crystals. Turning the flask round and round, he looked at the gallstones and then, turning abruptly to me, asked if I knew the ballad of the warrior Wallenstein. His question was completely out of keeping with the surroundings, but I answered, I know the story of the warrior Wallenstein, but not the ballad. Whereupon, smiling, he began to recite, he says some German, which translates into English, in the Wallenstein family, there are more gallstones than precious stones. My superior re recited several stanzas of that comic ballad. He was in such a good mood that I decided to ask a great favor of him, that he let me go look for my wife and child. Only after I had uttered the request did I realize how daring it was, but it was already too late. He looked at me with astonishment. You're married and have a child? Yes, Captain. I am married and have a 15-year-old daughter, I told him, my voice breaking with emotion. Do you think they are still here? He asked. Yes, Captain, because at our arrival three months ago, you selected them and sent them to the right-hand column. They have since been sent to another camp, he said. Suddenly I thought of the crematorium smoke. Perhaps they had been dispatched with that smoke to some celestial camp. Dr. Mengele, who was seated, his head bent forward, seemed lost in thought. I remained standing behind him. I'm going to give you a pass to go look for them, but, he said, and placing a forefinger on his lips, he looked at me menacingly. I understand, Captain, and thank you. So Ugh. that's Mengele gives him a pass and he finds his wife and his daughter who are alive. And he, because of the position he occupies, realizes that their camp is like a day or two away from being liquidated. Ugh. And so he warns them and he gets them to basically tells them how they can transfer to a work gang that's being moved to a separate location, which is not a clear survival thing, right? But it's like, look, if you get moved to this work gang, maybe you die there, but it, it's at least more days than you'll have here because right. they're going to kill everyone in this block. And they get out and they are, you know, Miklos survives the end of the war. He winds up on like what is supposed to be a death march with the SS guards as they flee. But he like, it's fucking, this guy's story is fucking miraculous. He makes it and he kind of like after everything is over winds up kind of stumbling back to his empty house and like sits down there and it's just like, I don't know what to do with my life anymore. Like, I'm never going to be a doctor again. I refuse to conduct another autopsy or anything like that. So he's just like alone in this house. And then like a couple of days later, his wife and his daughter show up. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. They um, show up. They survived. They live. Yes. Yes. Like Aww. I said, this is like. I'm sorry. I'm busting over that. That's uh, the best yeah, you can hope for. It, that is literally the best <laughs> possible of the outcomes. Yeah. Oh, um, it's yeah. I mean, there's 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 so much more to like. Say one thing that is probably worth noting is that the Sonder Commando that Miklos is with, the guys that he's kind of he's have been selected with him. He like lives in the barracks with them. They drink together. They wind up getting guns smuggled to them by partisans and carrying out a rebellion. And their entire goal in this rebellion inside the camp is that one of them escape so that people they could, someone can tell the world about what happened there. Wow. And, and they don't succeed in this. None of the the Sonder Commando who rebel survive. They get massacred. But they succeed in destroying one of the crematoria ovens as they die, which significantly limits the ability of Auschwitz to kill and dispose of people, nice. um, saving nice. God knows how many lives. Um, so that's cool. Uh, it sucks because it's just like, you know, the that is an incredible act of heroism. Mm -hmm. And it's just like. So many of those stories, I feel like I've not been introduced to so no. many of the stories, like the majority of them are just these awful fucking, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's so much more common to tell stories of, um, 
suffering than stories of resistance. Right. But, you know, there are numerous stories, especially in, in like the Polish territories yeah. of Jewish people and other victims who gain access to guns. They either had them before or they sometimes make them or they steal them from Nazis and they fight back. And that is that is a part of the Holocaust, too. And because they fight back. You know, even in each of these incidents, you know, maybe only a few people get saved. The descendants of those people who were saved through acts of resistance number today in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's a big deal. Um, Dr. Mengele obviously is hounded for the rest of his natural life until he dies drowning off the coast of or at a, <laughs> at a lake in Brazil. And he, he, yeah. But he's like, he's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he drowned to death? Oh, yeah, he drowns like a little fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Dope. Way to drown, you loser. Oh, I don't know. that's great. I didn't know it, that's how he died. What a, yeah, he what? fucking drowns. That's fucking cool. That is yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not the most painful way he could have gone. I would have preferred, like, hit by a car that has, like, a big spiky front end that I just mean, impales many, him in the dick and he's dragged for, like, 30 miles. He yeah. Been, he could have died. But yeah. at least it wasn't, like... Oh, he peacefully died in his sleep. No, he fucking yeah. no. He, fuck, he he does he does drown while on vacation. <laughs> oh, that's good. that's great. Uh, I, him drowning is good. Drowning is is you know. Like, it's, I'll take it's, it. It's yeah. panic before death. It's uh, yeah. A little he's bit at of least suffering. scared. That's good. And he's good. he's in bad health for years. He's very Great. lonely. He has Love a crush that. on this like child that he has as his housekeeper, but she he can't oh. marry her. Um, <laughs> it's uh, he's he, yeah. He's a gross piece of shit. Fuck yeah. him. Uh, the other doctors though, who had enabled his work and been his colleagues and benefited from the research he did, were not punished. Uh, oh. Doctor Julius Hallervorden was a respected neuropathologist and head of the histopathology department at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. He received hundreds of brains taken from euthanasia victims, uh, and he also killed many children at the Brandenburg Gordon Clinic where he worked and later removed their brains. He described these specimens to a colleague as wonderful material, feeble-minded, malformations, and early infantile disease. After the war, he had a neurological research position at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Uh, at the Brain Research Institute in Frankfurt, Hallervorden's specimens, including brains from the euthanasia program, were used by doctors until 1990, when they oh, were oh, finally oh, buried oh, we in doing? a cemetery. We, we, we had a happy ending. We had him yeah. drowning. Sorry. He was drowning. He was sad. <laughs> he, he couldn't fuck a child. It was, uh, then you're like, but here, yeah. there's some people who got away with it. Yeah, because most of the people who enabled Mengele pretty much all did. Uh, there's Dr. Fritz Lenz, who was a medically trained geneticist. After 1933, he was what head of... What is this section called in your notes? Is it, <laughs> is it like... Bum out Matt, Matt even more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in case Matt gets happy at end, give him more mm -hmm. sad. Yeah, yeah, get a little bit of extra sad. He was a, <laughs> d the head of the Department of Racial Hygiene at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and was one of the architects of the Holocaust. From 1946 to 1957, he was the director of the Institute for Human Genetics at the University of Göttingen. He continued to publish until the 1970s. And of course, our friend Ottmar von Verschuer, mm -hmm. as head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, obviously, he was responsible for a whole bunch of fucked up shit. Post-war, he was interned by the Allies in 1946. In 1951, he accepted a position at the University of Münster, where he established one of West Germany's largest genetic research centers. Verschuer retired in 1965 and died in 1969. I stopped listening after you said Dr. Douchebag drowned. Yeah. <laughs> This is the most depressing epilogue ever. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's I, I, just freeze frames yeah. of all of the people. It's like, not great. They all survived forever. I was Still like, yeah. alive really today. into the drowning part. Yeah. I bet he it's, shit himself when he was drowning, too. I, oh. we, we can all Hell hope yeah. so. Poop and in the pool, buddy. he probably drank some of the shit water. Mm -hmm. I hope so. That sounds And nice. he probably vomited when he drank the shit water, and then he uh, he ended up drinking more of the vomit shit water, and he did it forever till he died. Yeah. Wow. I mean, let's let's all hope. Let's all hope and pray. Let's, uh, we're all hoping this, and we're praying and let's, this. Let's not think too much about the fact that a great deal of these race scientists continued working into the 70s, and that a significant number of professional genetics researchers are not only influenced of their work, but still believe in aspects of racial science, which is still influential in genetic research to this day. Fun. There's There's a fucked up history of how much of this shit is still talked about. I mean, you can you can look at the fucking bell 
bell curve guy as right. an example, Charles right? Murray. Like, yeah, Charles Murray. This is still a problem. And part of why it's a problem is that when the war ended, all of these doctors who had spent their time at institutes, but who had been directly responsible for this kind of shit, weren't rounded up and shot in the back of the head. Yeah. Um, which is what we should have done. Easily. It just, it just, right, they were right there. Mm-hmm. You had guns. Yeah. Pop, 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 pop. You had so many guns. You were literally the allies. We, you could have, you could have gotten rid of them. Yeah. Um, this is like, you know, fucking, this is why I don't trust white allies. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. Man. You could, they should have just shot him, but instead now we have the bell curve guy and people yeah, still no, exactly garbage seriously. But you know what we also, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's just crazy uh, how much of uh, race science um, still exists today. And just like how there's, uh, it's just considered like part of like normal conservative thought, you know? Yeah, because it always has been. It it always has been, but it's just like so deeply ingrained in the ideology that it's like to lose the race science part of it is to lose like what holds it together it's like the glue and yeah. so that's why you know whenever someone is like well you know i'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative mm-hmm. yeah. as if it like makes them somehow like well i'm not a racist conservative and i'm yeah. like yeah your whole point of view is poison yeah yeah part of identifying as a fiscal conservative means that you're okay P- caucusing with the conservatives who are, you know, the other kind. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're, it's like, you're just, you're cool with a little bit of uh, race science. Oh, well, not me. No, no, not me personally, but uh, mm-hmm. I'll gladly just uh, shepherd them into power and mm-hmm. whatever will be, will be. Yeah. Que sera, ser Nazi. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you got you want to plug anything, Matt? Absolutely. Um, there's a, you see, Philip Morris also makes nicotine gum products, and I want to plug those right now. Oh, hell yeah. You, Thank you, Philip to, Morris. You're trying to quit smoking, but you don't want to stop giving money to the people who got you addicted. Mm-hmm. Nicorette gum. <laughs> it comes in four milligram and two milligram, but yeah. you can eat two of them. Uh, yeah. I, I also want to plug uh, my uh, The Wire podcast uh, slash Sopranos podcast. Pod yourself a gun. Uh, yeah, um, fucking listen to it. Uh, you know, give us a review. Uh, fucking be our friend. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's a good podcast. Uh, you will enjoy it if uh, you enjoy me. And I hope you do because I I love you guys out there. And I, I want to pivot off that and and note that we now have a behind the bastards branded nicotine gum. You know, mm-hmm. Big League Chew. It's just fifty percent Big League Chew and fifty percent actual tobacco chew. Oh, I love it! Perfect. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, bigger yeah. league chew. It's bigger league chew. Yeah, yeah it's big mm-hmm. league chew for adults. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's you good, only it's get good half stuff. Oral cancer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you get only... that Nick rush and a sugar rush. It's great. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.